All right, let's give this a shot. Okay, so here we are at the beginning of this whole uh, molecular biology description, which I'm going to do my best to make very clear, and I'm going to do my best to uh, develop piece by piece in a way that's really easy to construct from the ground up. And in the interest of constructing things really from the ground up, starting at the beginning, and then breaking it down into manageable chunks, we're going to start today with the idea called the central dogma. So I'm going to write that out. It's called the central. Central because it's sort of the core of molecular biology. And dogma perhaps is a bad choice. Uh, Crick of Watson and Crick himself um, had problems with the fact that he used the word dogma after the fact. He just thought it was sort of a nice word, uh, you know, different from hypothesis. But it really should be the central hypothesis because you should feel free to doubt this. Dogma implies it shouldn't be doubted. But you should doubt the central dogma and you should question it, just like you should question all scientific ideas uh, as you explore them. But the central dogma's central idea is the progression of information within a cell from DNA to protein. And that is from sort of the hard drive of the cell to the working machinery of the cell. So I'm going to draw this out. Um, this should be very quick, but we're just going to draw out what the central dogma is. We're going to sort of fill in the caveats and the sort of special situations that sometimes apply. And then finally, uh, we'll talk about how that leads in to other fields of study. So how, for example, the study of DNA leads into special methods and special questions, while the study of protein leads to its own special questions and special ideas. And uh, that's going to form a kind of outline for where we're going to go from here. So, all right, I've said enough about that. Let's just get to it. So the central dogma says that DNA, DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, makes, DNA makes, I'm going to do makes with a little arrow here, DNA makes RNA, really it forms a template for RNA, which then forms a template for protein. Okay, and this actually may look familiar to you already. This might be, this might not be very interesting. DNA makes RNA makes protein. Uh, so let's go into detail now. So DNA is this nice double-stranded molecule. And what we mean by DNA makes RNA makes protein is we mean that the nucleotide sequence in DNA forms a template from which we then make in RNA sequence that's complementary to that. So you make a complementary sequence, and that's RNA. And we'll go into the details of this later, but let's just sketch it out to start. So this forms a template for RNA, and then RNA, through a somewhat stranger process that was figured out by a man named Sidney Brenner, uh, makes, and, and Crick, of course, uh, primarily, makes protein. All right, and protein, uh, this is through these strange things called tRNAs. It allows an agglomming on of specific amino acids to form a protein, which is a series of amino acids which usually has a certain structure and has a certain activity. So uh, that is it. It's very simple. So the DNA uh, forms the core template. This is, uh, this is the hard drive, as I said. The RNA is kind of the intermediate. And then the protein is the machinery that does a lot of the work in the cell. Or does it? So this is actually ends up being a little bit more complicated, right? Because like all things in science, uh, the first thing you figure out is usually the simplified version, and then everything becomes more complicated. So DNA, in addition to making RNA, is capable of forming a template for itself. So DNA can form a template for itself. Uh, it turns out that this process requires protein. So protein helps DNA be a template for itself. Protein kind of influences and helps in this process of DNA replication. We have RNA in viruses. So I'm going to put this in a different color because it's a special situation. But RNA in some viruses can form a template for more RNA. And RNA can also form a template for making DNA. Again, in viruses, this is the process called reverse transcription, and it's very important in human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, 
that RNA can form a template for DNA. And protein also, of course, helps in these two processes, right? So protein's helping out in RNA making itself, and protein's helping out in RNA going backwards to DNA. So, uh, right, so we had this nice simple picture of DNA making RNA making protein, and then it turns out that there's some more complicated details to it that are true mostly in viruses, not usually in eukaryotic human cells or animal cells, but they're important to know about, and so I put them in here. So given this general template of these three core ingredients, there's sort of different fields of study that focus individually on each of these ingredients. I'm just going to call them ingredients. I don't know that that's a good, that's a good name for them, but we're just going to call them ingredients. So in, in the study of DNA, you can study DNA replication. This is an entire area of study. You know, people devote their lives to the question of how DNA replicates itself in a very exact way. How did we break this down into its component pieces? There's DNA repair. This is another area. This is how when DNA gets an error in itself, how does it fix that error? And this, this actually involves, again, a lot of little specific proteins. And then how does the DNA know that an error is an error and not just what was supposed to be there? whole bunch of questions going on there. Totally separate issues. Very interesting. And, uh, of course, in other areas, there's this thing called chromatin, which is long, long strands of DNA uh, to make chromosomes have to get condensed down. So a long strand of DNA has to get kind of coiled up to turn into a chromosome. And, you know, chromosomes are usually drawn kind of like this. They have these nice little sort of X shape, right? I don't know if you've seen this before, but you have this nice little sort of X-shaped chromosome. And this is really coiled tightly uh, DNA, and they call this chromatin, and it has all these interesting consequences in terms of what parts of DNA can make RNA, and what parts are coiled so tightly that they can't actually make RNA. And so this ends up being another complete area. And there's, there's all kinds of interesting methods in dealing with DNA that you will need to learn to be able to work in the lab, and you'll use them every day. So one of them, I'm just going to use an example, is called PCR, which uh, I believe is, um, yes, it's polymerase. And this is going to sound kind of arcane, but don't worry about it. Polymerase chain reaction. I like that chain reaction. It sounds very exciting. It's actually much less exciting than it sounds, but that's okay. Polymerase chain reaction, PCR. This is an everyday technique used in labs that uses very simple properties of DNA to do uh, some pretty powerful things. So this is this is kind of an important core element of working in molecular biology lab, PCR. And then in RNA, you have all kinds of other questions too. So uh, let's change to our RNA color. So we have RNA folding which is um, how one strand of long RNA kind of folds in on itself and makes a structure, kind of like a protein makes a structure, and then can sometimes do a job. Then uh, we're going to talk a lot about RNA splicing, and I won't go into that right now. You sort of have an idea of what splicing is already, um, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk in more detail about what RNA splicing is from the beginning because I think that's important. I misspelled this, but I don't know how to fix it, so we're just going to go with it. And uh, also we're going to talk about non-coding RNA. So this is RNA that doesn't eventually go on to make protein. Some RNA just gets made, and then it its entire point is to be RNA, and usually to have some kind of folded structure and then do some specific job on its own. It isn't a halfway point, it's actually the end point. So we'll talk about non-coding RNA. And in the world of protein, we're going to talk about some... Um, we're just going to talk very briefly about these things. We're going to talk about folding, of course, because uh, folding is the way that a protein turns into a useful protein. We're going to talk a little bit about the process of translation, so the process of uh, turning RNA into protein, which is, is, which is an interesting and important process. And we're going to talk a little bit also about... Um, well, I, I don't know if we'll actually be able to get into this, but we'll talk about uh, mutation effect prediction. Just mutation effect here, but mutation effect prediction, which is when you make a change in the DNA, trying to figure out what that might mean about what changes will occur 
in the protein. And this will take us down a whole interesting road of um, protein alignments and trying to figure out what elements of proteins are essential for their function versus what are kind of inessential um, and just sort of along for the ride. And all of these ideas are going to be core to doing your work over the summer. And I think each one of these is a sort of bite-sized idea that I'll try to describe in roughly 10 minutes. So I've taken a little bit longer than I'd intended, but I hope I've given you a good picture of what we're going to work on and what we're going to take a look at um, on our way to talking about sequencing, how to understand sequencing, and how we can use DNA sequencing as a tool to understand the basic core processes of the cell. So thanks for watching, and um, I'll see you again soon.